Please pray with me. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. May the words of my mouth and meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 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 For grace, mercy, and peace be yours this day from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. The text for this morning's meditation comes to us from our Gospel lesson in Luke chapter 4. Hogan's Heroes was a television show dedicated to showing how a captured group of individuals was able to inflict harm upon the German from inside the camp. Now, I was not old enough to see these first run, as most of you can figure out. But obviously, seeing the show, quite a humorous understanding of what takes place as they try to outwit the somewhat less intelligent German officers. Now, of course, if you watch the show, you know that it's absolutely nothing compared to what it's actually like, apparently, to be held captive in a wolf. I stumbled upon a group called the Barnabas Group, and they discussed that very thing. How many individuals will say how tough and difficult it is to actually be behind any lines and not know what's taking place. Constantly worried day to day about whether or not we're going to be alive the next day or not. Being told news about the war, but not sure if it's actually the truth or not. All kinds of of spiritual oppression and bodily harm, as well as the the, the mental understanding of it all, constantly being worried and in fear, while at the same time struggling with the fact that while you are sitting in prison, not being able to help or assist, your brothers and sisters are fighting for you in the battle. They may be winning, they may be losing, but you don't know. But many of them are losing their life while you are sitting helpless. You're just yearning, wondering if you'll ever be set free. Now, like I said, I can't imagine what that would be like. But maybe that sets the tone for us to hear Jesus' words when he says, I've come to set the captives free. Or maybe a better understanding of liberty in this text is not to bring liberty, but release for those who are in prison. Isn't that a great picture? Of those who who feel like they have absolutely nothing at all, but Jesus comes to release us permanently, forever. But unfortunately, the kind of tone that Jesus has received when he proclaims this is not the kind of tone that you might expect. For he is in quite a precarious situation as he comes to his hometown. He's going to have wonderful news of proclaiming the words to the people who are captive, but the problem is these people don't want to be free. They want signs. They want wonders. They want to know about everything that Jesus did before, how uh, everything they've heard about that's taken place, they want to happen here and now. Now, we don't exactly hear in Luke's Gospel about Capernaum, but if you look at Mark, Mark tells us everything that takes place that gets his hometown's attention. As you can imagine, Jesus waltzes into the synagogue and starts proclaiming God's word, and immediately the people are amazed. In fact, they say he teaches as one who has authority even greater than the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes, the people who are normally there. Now, after this is over, he immediately then casts out a demon, and the people are marveled by all this. Then he goes and heals people of their illnesses, their diseases, of those who are, who are deaf, all of a sudden hear and mute, speak, and all the things that we know Jesus does. Then he travels to a house, and the, the crowds now are completely surrounding Jesus. This is very important, because the word is getting out. Everybody wants to know what this Jesus is about. The house is so jam-packed that people are lined up outside of the house just so they can get a 
a glimpse, and she didn't even hear of what he has to say. But then there's this, this, this man who, who can't walk. He's lifted up by his buddies on top of a roof. They, they open up the house, they peel back the tiles, and then they lower him down. Great moment in the Gospel of Mark. But what does Jesus say? He doesn't say, get up and walk. Not at first. He says, sir, your sins are forgiven. You see, we've got to remember that when Jesus has these signs and these wonders, the signs and wonders are not the destination. Signs point to something that is coming. You see, at first, people are listening to this and saying, wait a second, that's not what this guy needs. Oh, really? <laughs> what good is it to walk if you're walking into eternity without God? What good is it to, to rise to your feet and, and get a job, make a living, have all the riches of the world, if those riches of the world you cannot take with you? What good is it to be set free if you're not actually free. But of course, Jesus says, so that you know I have the authority to do this great thing. Hops. Take up your mat and go. And yes, even an individual who cannot walk can walk when Jesus declares it. It's amazing. So Jesus comes to his hometown. And all the things that he has been doing are pointing to that great release. The, re the release that he is going to proclaim in this passage. I have come to bring release. Not just the stuff that you see on earth, but an eternal release. You expect there to be fireworks, right? A great praise finally is here. And the people are astonished. They are amazed but not entirely. You can almost imagine people kind of looking at one another from across the synagogue. But this is, this is Joseph's time. This is, this is Joseph's boy. I know we did all of those things and we've heard about that, but we saw him live in that house over there. The Isaiah, he has come to fulfill the Isaiah, the one that we read about every single week. Joseph's son. How can this really be? Not many miracles of God. They have their own understanding of who Jesus is. But they're really going to get upset, aren't they? <laughs> When Jesus really calls them out, hey, guess what? You were just like your ancestors. You know the stories, right? Of all the prophets and how they were rejected by the people of Israel because they didn't want to hear the word of God. Elijah was rejected, so he went to a Gentile. Elisha was rejected, so he went to a Gentile. Guess what? You're rejecting God's word in me, and guess what? The promise is going to go to the Gentiles as well. And the people are fuming. They are so angry. They are so frustrated. They are so mad. They take them up to throw them off a cliff. And the very sign that they were looking for, the very miracle that they were hoping to see to prove that this son of a carpenter actually was the Christ they miss as Jesus just somehow slips through their fingers. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? That because they know Jesus, they will never know Jesus. Because they think they know Jesus, they miss him entirely. I think about that for just a second. Do we miss Jesus? No, if we do, there's actually a word for that. Slavery. Just think about it for a second. Uh, a great word here from Malachi. Bear with me. Malachi 
Malachi says, put the Lord to the test. That's what he says. Put the Lord to the test and bring, I'm going to say the key word, right? And I know it's a curse word sometimes in church. Bring the whole tithe, there it is, the whole tithe into the storehouse. And see if you will not receive a blessing of overflowing abundance. And he's not just talking about money. He's talking about time. He's talking about talents. Bring all of those things and see if God will not bless you beyond anything that you could give. Great word, right? Maybe next week, John. I will read your word. This month is tough. I hear what you're saying, and I'm sure there's some truth to it. But I know my circumstances now. I know what your word is saying, but I know my schedule. I know what you're saying. But I know my ability, and I just don't think I can get it done. Believe me, friends, this convicts me. We might know a lot of things, but is what we know about life and experiences get in the way of knowing Jesus and the freedom that he brings? Paul says, do not be anxious about Anything. 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 But by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. But maybe you're like me. Instead of having those requests, what we do? Worry, 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 worry. If it doesn't happen, then you worry, 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 worry. If that thing doesn't happen, then you worry, 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 worry. And it goes on. And on and on. And I should really keep going, shouldn't I? I know to bring my request to God, but I know if I just continue to worry, 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 somehow that thing will magically just not happen. I know that if I worry, 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 that I will somehow be able to contain it all and keep it in my control, and then somehow the situation is going to better itself, where God's word clearly says, bring all your requests to God. That's a slavery. In case none of those, those two things don't describe you, how about this one? All throughout the Old Testament, God says, do what is right, so that it may be well with you. I mean, what those commandments are. You know what his law states. But I also know that I might have a little enjoyment if I do this. What's it really going to hurt? What does it really matter? From what I know, it doesn't seem to have done much before. So I know I'll be okay now. It's as if we're telling God, I know what you're saying, but I know what's been okay in the past. What is the word for that too? Same word. Slavery. And whenever we choose to live those ways, Instead of God's ways. We usually find regret, don't we? Or anger, or resentment, or a lot of other things that don't bring us freedom, but bring us as slaves. You don't fall asleep, you? But that's, that's why I'm glad these verses are actually in this season of epiphany. Because there is a great epiphany. In fact, there are two great epiphanies or revelations about Jesus here. Is that one, he does come to bring freedom. Right? Jesus comes to bring freedom. Those who are lame, they jump for joy. That's freedom. Those who are, are blind, they see. That's freedom. Those who are deaf, they're able to hear with Jesus present. There is an earthly sense of freedom that we see 
in Jesus. But this is his second epiphany. That Jesus is the prophet who must be rejected. And he is. As he is rejected all the way to the cross, as he believes for you and for me, so that you and I would not be enslaved, but actually know freedom. And that's the wonderful, great proclamation that I get to have to give to you today. That while you know your sins, and while you know your shortcomings, that you know the truth in Jesus, that today you are free. Amen. Or as Jesus says, if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. Now as we close, though, I have to have to quote Paul one more time. Where he says, Do not use your freedom to indulge in sinful behavior, but use that freedom to serve one another in love. Praise the Christ. We're free. Now, I don't know what choices you're going to make today. I don't know what you're going to dedicate to your offerings this year. But you're free to put out the test. I don't know if you're going to choose what is right, but you're free to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. To see what kind of freedom that brings. I don't know what you're going to do with your worries, but you're free to bring every single request to God, every one. So, brothers and sisters of Christ, tomorrow, today, and always, live as people who are free. For you are free indeed. Amen. Amen. And may the peace of God, which is found only in Jesus Christ, may the peace of God found in Christ continue to remain with us through all of our days, showing us the freedom that we have.